This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us on Libertarian Counterpoint today. With me is my co-host Richard Fields and our friend of the show, John Cameron. Gentlemen, how you guys doing today? We have, um, you guys are the loyalty type. So let's ask, start with this. Trump fires the U.S. attorney out of New York. Now, U.S. attorneys serve at the pleasure of the president if my memory serves. But So what's the issues behind this? I actually didn't have a chance to get caught up. Well, uh, the, the reason that uh, uh, Mr. Berman uh, has uh, earned the displeasure of the president is because he, have, he has investigated and uh, indicted a couple of the uh, the president's attorneys, including most recently Judy, uh, Rudy Giuliano, uh, Giuliani. He, he hasn't been indicted yet, but the previous one was. So uh, uh, Trump has a, a bone to pick with the uh, U.S. attorney. He tried to make an announcement unbeknownst to the attorney that he had resigned. And the guy said, no, I haven't resigned. And so then Trump said, OK, well, then you're fired and uh, the, your assistant will take over. So that's where it stands right now. Uh, I'm not sure that there's a, a libertarian uh, slant on this issue. Uh, you know, he fired the guy that was investigating uh, his people. Looks like uh, a, a Saturday Night Massacre to me, but who the hell knows? Yeah. Question on that. I don't think it's there's a libertarian slant on it either. I thought, but uh, isn't isn't uh, New York famous for uh, a uh, I don't know, vendetta, I guess. You know, all of the lawsuits against Trump are coming out of New York courts and New York prosecutors and everything else. So, I think it's fair to say that uh, Trump is not fa uh, not particularly popular in his hometown. Hmm. That makes yeah. sense. I think With that's all we need to talk about that one. It's just, um, the, you know, the, I call them the, the uh, what do I call them? The unaccountables. I mean, these people in, in you know, these political offices do, do whatever they want from the president down to these minor uh, officials at these independent and completely unconstitutional regulatory agencies. So, I mean, who knows? It's, it's all power politics. And I don't think, I mean, they're all, they're all guilty as hell. And, and none of, none of the previous presidents, uh, none of president Hussein's uh, uh, antics were, you know, nobody indicted him and went after him for equally egregious stuff because he was he was you know in favor of the deep state loved him. So, I'm like, what the heck is Trump? Am I a Trump fan? No, uh, but if you look at the popular press, uh, it doesn't look like fifty point some odd percent or forty nine point some odd percent of the uh, American people voted for the guy. It looks like everybody in the country hates him. So, I'm I have no idea. What, what, whose side is right on this one? It seems like dueling corruption to me. You've got these attorneys who kind of operate on their own, on their own, kind of doing their own thing. And then you've got Trump who kind of does their own thing. And no one really cares about what's ethical or legal or it's just what serves our best interests. Except for libertarians. They care. Yeah. Move on to the next subject. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we're back here. Has Please. statue removal has gone too far? We're watching down in uh, Golden Gate Park. They removed this. They took down a protesters, pulled down a statue of Ulysses S. Grant. And I guess there was a statue of Thomas Jefferson somewhere that I don't remember off the top of my head was pulled down. And so have all these statue removals gone too far? I mean, you can make a point, right? That some of these yeah. minor figures, it's time to move on. You know, the they also, statue. They also they also yeah, pulled no, down no. A, a statue of uh, Teddy Roosevelt and uh, a, an Indian and uh, a black guy uh, on either side of him in at the uh, New York, uh, the American Museum of uh, Natural History, uh, just over the weekend. Now, libertarians don't have any uh, any uh, admiration for the first and loud mouth, most loudmouthed uh, neoconservative progressive, Teddy Roosevelt. He was not a, a good president or a particularly good guy, uh, but certainly USS Grant. He was the guy that led the Army to victory over the Confederacy. Now, he did own a slave for a short period of time. It was a slave that was gifted to him by his in-laws and which he later sent, set free. So I think the, uh, the uh, statue of, of uh, Grant coming down in San Francisco is due more to ignorance on the part of whoever the uh, people pulling the statue down uh, well, than anything about, else. How about hooliganism? 
because I think if you if you scratched uh, ancestor, we can't plug a product. Any of these ancestry things that find out uh, people's family trees, that every everybody in the crowd, no matter what the color of their skin, uh, their uh, forebears would have at some point or another been a guilty party to genocide, slaveholding. Uh, just go down the list. I mean, we all have rapscallions in our ancestry. Is that what you're saying? Well, and and the past morals of the past are not the morals of the the present. I mean, things that were went for common practice. Uh, um, you know, what the the whole drive behind prohibition in this country was was basically because of the high level of drunkenness and spousal abuse. But spousal abuse wasn't. Um, you know, wasn't, I don't think, punishable by law. And now, you know, you you get drunk, go home and drag your wife, you know, by the hair and beat her a little bit and throw her out the front door and you go into prison. Back then, you know, that was, that was accepted practice. So times change, people change. Painting, um, you know, what people do uh, with, with the paintbrush of the past is, uh, I think it's a mistake. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, it may be it may be a mistake, but I think there's you know plenty of good reason to uh, take down the statues of you know uh, avowedly racist leaders of the Confederacy, whose statues were built as a as, as a sop to the uh, to the South when during the Reconstruction phase. I think that there you know there are there are good instances where the statues should be taken down. I draw the well, light at USS Grant. And I'm I I agree with the the fact that you shouldn't celebrate people who who um, held the slaves and defended slaves. And I also agree that we have this thing uh, we have an amendment. I think it might be the first one that guarantees freedom of expression and is not a, a statue or form of expression. Right, but when you're talking about statues in the public square on public property. That's making the government, uh, saying the government can say whatever it feels like saying, including uh, saying something racist. And I don't think that uh, that's something that we should support. I think that's something that we should uh, guard against. Uh, certainly if the statue of an offending Southern uh, plantation owner, general, whatever, uh, is uh, moved to private property, I have no problem with that. That's probably where it should have been in the first place. Right. But in the public square, I, yeah, I think that's problematical. So, well, I think, well, I think the issue is here that maybe we have to understand that these some of these statues served a purpose during reconciliation, right? They were put up there for reconciliation to kind of honor an old tradition and old culture, but we've moved past that now, that the reconciliation is no longer kind of the goal. And so some of these statues of these minor figures can be moved, can be moved away or reframed mm -hmm. or put into private hands. Or statues just, of Washington who freed his slaves, uh, you know, are we going to na rename the nation's capital in Washington State? I, you know, how far? Wh where do you? Where do you? Uh, wh when does the? Re when does this whole thing descend into, into uh, you know, just semantic well, arguments? Yeah, and history well, is I a complicated think... place, right? Washington was the man who could have been king and walked away. Does that? Do we forget about that part because he owned slaves? You know, because he was also a man of his time. You know, it's a very difficult line to walk. And the problem is we're not even having the discussion. We're just kind of randomly tearing down statues and either what is either a mindless emotionalism or it's, you know, something larger Marxists want to tear down history, that kind of thing. It's, and it's hard to know from this far apart, from this far away. Well, I mean, you have, you have people, if you're going to, this is like, again, the Cardinals uh, arguing over how many angels can dance on the head of a pen in some respects, but I think you have people who are avowed, they're espousing national socialism in this country and has apparently forgot that a national socialist uh, in this country called Germany was responsible for the murder of, uh, you know, a, a, a tremendous genocide in the name of yeah. national socialism and they're espousing the yeah. same thing. So yeah. should, they, should they have uh, the right um, to espouse that under the same amendment. Anyway, we could go on. I think it's time to move to the next subject. This is, hopefully this will blow over. I do know that 
some First Amendment rights about the uh, about the BLM thing are being violated. I mean, people are losing their jobs for something as simple as saying when they were asked if Black Lives Matter, they responded all lives matter, and they didn't say Black Lives Matter first, and were fired. So, I'm, yeah, you know, Grant Napier of the of the, the you know the voice of the Sacramento King was fired for that. And I, and but I, I think, think that's more more a, a business decision. They're saying that. Uh, it's uh, kind of missing the point to say all lives matter of the, you know, to, it's, it's a way of dismissing that black lives matter semantically. And, you know, I have no problem with the Kings firing Grant Napier. Uh, that's a, a business decision and they made it for business reasons. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. They will. And I, know so. I, I didn't like listening to him anyway, so I was happy he's gone for whatever reason. They can, they can <laughs> use your tax dollars, not mine to defend the first amendment lawsuit that he probably won't bring. But yeah, and then you know, and, and then we can also to, not give money to the Sacramento Kings. That would be another good thing, uh, you know. To well, build I, the I, yeah, I, yeah. If if uh, anyway, that's not libertarian either. But I would love to. I could go on for an hour and a half about that. If if building sports arenas was a wonderful thing, then you'd have capitalists lined up fighting for the chance to fund the thing. So we know that the taxpayers are going to take it in the shorts over this thing. Yeah. Oh, no, now we got a soccer stadium. Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's, it's guess gets worse around here. Yeah. Right. So as we're talking about government overreach, um, the issue, government issued a mask mandate here in California and then law enforcement across the state says, we're not going to bother enforcing it, which makes sense to me because we're just sitting here, you know, we're sitting here telling law enforcement, stop enforcing things that aren't crimes. And now we're going to tell them to go enforce people not wearing masks. It's our government doesn't seem to know what it's doing. Yeah, well, well, I tell you what, the whole, the whole mask thing is. Is... Go ahead, Jeff. Doesn't government doesn't know what it's doing? I mean, I. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I'm ready to talk to you guys because you're obviously coded in in viruses. Hence the problem with my computer. Okay. <laughs> uh, when. when 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 we're done here, so here here's my here's my take on my crazy John Cameron slash libertarian take on this. Doctor Faustus, as we refer to him, or Fauci, stated over and over and over again at the beginning of this panic demic is what I call it that people shouldn't wear masks. Now many studies are coming in saying that. Uh, the, this kind of mask, the homemade mask, this is a very good homemade mask because it's got a bacterial antiviral filter in it that came out of a house air conditioning filter. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's good. But he came out saying that it would be a waste of time and da 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 da. Now, recently, um, he basically admitted that the reason he said that was that not he knew that this type of mask would cut down on transmission by 40%. But he wanted to make sure that healthcare professionals had enough PPE to deal with this thing. My question is, when is he going to be tried for the murder of the 40% additional deaths that he caused by disinforming people about something that could have saved their lives? Yeah, you know, the whole thing about the coronavirus is the, whole, the science, alleged science of this whole thing changes uh, with uh, by the week or even by the hour or, or by the day. Uh, we were told initially that masks don't make a difference, just wash your hands. And we were told that masks make all the difference. Uh, now we're being told that uh, the uh, immunity that you get from having had uh, uh, the, the virus doesn't necessarily uh, last because a new mutation of the virus may uh, be able to reinfect you. This whole thing is, is about as complicated a thing as uh, I've ever uh, come across. What we do know without any question at all is that the government response to the virus has been totally oblivious to the, uh, the extraneous costs of the uh, economic shutdown no, that the government imposed. I wouldn't use the word extraneous, but I don't like to correct your English, but is it far from extraneous? The, the mental health costs alone, um, you know, the only people who are going to make out after this thing are divorce lawyers and bankruptcy attorneys. So, well, uh, I mean, the, the, the side effects, to put it that way, the, the trade-offs yeah. ignored. 
And uh, that's continuing to be the case. We we now have the governor saying you got to wear a mask anywhere in the state of California if you're out uh, out, out in the public. And well, not out, uh, not yeah. outside. Well, any place that you're, you know, any any indoor in any enclosed space where you're with other people on the bus or at the grocery store or wherever. Mm-hmm. And you know, if people, if the bus company or the grocery store or the hardware store or wherever you go wants to say wear masks and i would support them wanting to say what you know we want you to wear masks uh that's fine but for the the governor to say this is an infraction or a crime or whatever is you know a violation of my executive order that i think is a step too far in the way of uh, violating people's civil civil rights if you don't want to wear a mask at a place at a store where they require them go to another store that doesn't i think it's actually kind of worse than that because it's a this whole thing is it's not just a mandate from the governor for his executive order. He actually punted to the health department. The health department made the order and the politicians aren't making these orders. The health departments are, which is why they're not one of the reasons why they're not um, considering other factors because the politicians don't have to pick, make the decision. It's not my decision. It's the health department that made the decision, but health well, departments only think yeah. about health, right? Health that's departments don't think about the economy. Health that's departments. Another, don't think, yeah. And so that's, that's problem with the, uh, with the delegation of power by both the legislative legislative branch and the executive branch to delegate uh, the uh, writing the legislation or writing the rules or coming up with the uh, executive order to uh, flunkies that can't get fired, people bureaucrats that have civil service protection, uh, you can't you can't fire them. Uh, they're protected by the civil service. Uh, the uh, legislature or the governor can say, well, ain't my fault. It's this you know the people that uh, I delegated to. They made a mistake. Uh, it's a total lack of both transparency and, more importantly, accountability. Yeah, there's. I absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the whole point of the whole Why system. Why can't we, we fire them, though? I'm I'm just kind of curious about that. When did when did government employees become the untouchables and the all powerful and all the rest of that? Is isn't their job to serve us, the taxpayers? Well, I can actually give you an answer for that one. It's because, Andrew Jackson and the spoil system and the aftermath of that. Well, it's not just that. It's it's the uh, the uh, in theory, the average poli- the average bureaucrat needs to be able to tell the the politician the truth. And if and if the politician can fire you for for not for telling you the truth, then you're not going to tell it to them. You're going to tell them what they want to hear. The problem is they do that anyway. There's so few poli- there's so few bureaucrats who are willing to go to a hearing and tell the politicians no, we can't do that. That it doesn't happen. I have lots of poli- I have lots of bureaucrats in my family. We have this discussion all the time. So <laughs> high level bureaucrats in my family, they can go, you know, my stepfather is one who had a reputation of going to a meeting and saying, no, I'm not going to do that because you don't give me the, you don't give me the resources I need to accomplish that goal. And I'm not coming back here next year, have, answering the question of why we didn't get it done. So you either give me the resources I'm asking for, or I'm not doing it. And so they give him the resources he's asking for, and he would actually get his stuff done. But so few bureaucrats are actually willing to go to a politician or to a group of politicians and tell them the truth, the hold card, the, you know, the card, the cold, hard truth. I can speak <laughs> that the politicians just do what they want. Yeah, I mean, the original the origination of the civil service protection of jobs was after uh, Andrew Jackson made a made a uh, essentially a standing joke of the, of the spoil system, which was as soon as a new uh, politician was elected, he'd fire everybody and every bureaucrat in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, and bring in his own people. And, uh, you know, it was it was, you know, a very much a winner take all system. And the reform movement said, oh, no, we have to let the uh, the. Uh, the bureaucrats, the civil servants, they need to be protected from the whims of, a, of, a, of an autocratic president. And that's fine, but now it's gone so far that unions, unionization of, uh, of bureaucrats have gone to the point where it is almost, almost literally impossible to fire a civil servant for anything other than uh, sleeping with a dead antelope. Yeah, it is. It's pretty dead antelope. Is that what you said? Yeah. So, <laughs> well, even that live, might be hard. Live, live antelopes are okay, but it's dead antelopes. That are- <laughs> right, you know, hyperbole. Okay. Oh uh, well, you should hear some of the yeah. stories. I can't tell you guys that we hear that people who, sh- in any normal business, would get fired, and they don't get fired. It's just in any normal structure of life. You know, how in the hell is that person not fired? 
but they get counsels and they get all kinds of different chances and moved around and you're going, how in the hell is this person not fired? But I can't tell you guys. It's, it's worse than being a, ca a Catholic priest, con uh, you know, uh, accused of uh, child molestation. It might be. It might get to that bad level. Okay, so we were talking about uh, politicians using political power for uh, political gain here. Occupational licensing for political gain. There was a uh, article in Reason Magazine about how Governor Cuomo was using uh, the power of occupational licensing to get back at his political opponent. I'm shocked. So what else, so what else is new? I mean, uh, not only do uh, the people who have a business want to protect their turf by making sure that they have no competition, so they capture the regulatory agency. It's called regulatory capture. There's a word for it or a phrase for it. They capture the agency, and then they write rules. I'll just, so I know what Richard was going to say. I'll fill in for him. No, go ahead, Richard. Sorry, you froze there for a minute. Protect your turf was the last thing we heard. Protect, your, protect their turf by writing regulations that are so stringent and so difficult to uh, negotiate that they have a de facto monopoly or oligopoly in that particular line of business. We see that in uh, pesticide uh, control. We see that in movers. We see that in uh, just about any licensed uh, occupation that you think of, electricians, plumbers, whatever, any, any you know, landscapers, for God's sake, uh, certainly the medical professions. Hairstylists. Uh, they're in, hairstylists yeah, have more mine. regulatory burdens than... Uh, than cops do, right? We just, that's one of the things we've learned recently is that hairstylists have to go through more, more regulatory, uh, more training than a cop does. Yeah, John, John wouldn't actually know about that. <laughs> well, either would I, but well, you know, see, that's that, for different reasons. You know, this is the, the one uh, time when those regulations might be worthwhile. I had a full mane of red hair and I went to an unlicensed hair. No, that's not the case. I started shaving my head 20 years ago and now I couldn't grow hair in the middle part of it if my life depended on it. So what the hell? But then again, I got the pretty head. So, um, yeah. And and it, this stuff bothers me in that you know the more you look at the history of it, the the more every time every time you license anything or put a government requirement around it, anything, as you said, Richard, it becomes uh, a way to um, effectively keep competition away. But more than that, it's it's government sponsored extortion. And, you know, the, when, if you can threaten somebody's liquor license and they're a bar or a restaurant, it's it's basically the, the death knell uh, of their business if, if you take it away. And so you got to toe the line. And I don't you know, before prohibition, when they when they took prohibition away, they they added it back with all these strings and everything attached. And I don't, I don't understand how this happened. You know, being, being a, you know, a radical capitalist and libertarian, I mean, let anybody do whatever they want. And if you don't want, as long as they're not actively hurting somebody else, and if you don't want to do business with them, leave. I would love to see a competitor to the AMA in this country. And, um, you know, I think medical costs would go down, and I think uh, service would go up. I mean, but we. Yeah, I mean, in effect, we have medical competitions through the AMA. Unfortunately, they're in uh, places like uh, Thailand and India and Brazil, and uh, you know, not Mexico. easily accessible. Belize, here. Belize, you know, Mexico. There's awful lots of people that are that are doing. I mean, even uh, bionic teeth. You know, you factor in, you can go to Mexico and get great dental work done for about a third of the cost here. And even if you factor in the, the cost of the trip and everything else, why? Because the, the oral surgeons union is so strong here, they price fix. So, I mean, this happens over and over and over again, and especially in the medical world, which is 18% of our GNP. And the only people in the world that are, you know, spending anything near that are the Swiss and Hell, they can afford it. We sure as hell can't. We're too busy, you know, destroying our country with stupid rules about a, a bug that, you know, if you counted apples to apples and orange to oranges, is no more deadly for 99.8 percent of people than the flu. So, well, I think you can safe, safely say that for the for the population in general, it's about twice uh, as uh, as dangerous as the flu. It's twice as dangerous as the flu. A, a reason to shut down the economy and. Uh, uh, and indirectly cause uh, probably just as many or more deaths than you than the flu would cause without the shutdown. Probably not. 
Yeah. Well, well the well, socialist is way more is way more deadly than that, but you never mind. It's well, this this regulatory mindset actually extends far deeper than most people most people think. I, as, as someone running for office, I can tell you the the regulatory issue around raising money, finance reform. Right? Everybody talks about campaign finance reform. Well, let me tell you, as a small candidate, the campaign finance reform is one of the reasons we don't want to run. Is because just trying to comply with with campaign finance laws is mind boggling. And it's, if you don't have someone to pay for it, if you can't afford the lawyers. To, to kind of go through all the issues, make sure you don't trip over something. It's a pain in the butt. We have, we literally have candidates who are going to, I'm not raising $2,000. So I don't have to comply with the, with the campaign finance laws. It's not worth it. If you raise less than 10 grand, it's not worth it to try to comply to com, to, to comply. Now we're doing it just because we want to learn. We need the experience. We need to train people how to, how to deal with this. But for a lot of campaigns, a small independent campaigns trying to run a, the campaign finance is actually the biggest hurdle of why people don't do it. It's not the, it's not the issue of going out to, of having to express yourself and go amongst the public. That's not it. It's trying to comply with all these various rules and regulations and what, what number do you have to put on what flyer and, you know, all these various minor rules that you can trip over and get fined 10 grand and your, your campaign is over. And so these rules and regulations are designed to keep competition out, as John was talking about how they design and Richard were talking about how they design these fields to keep competition out. It works in politics, too. Yeah, not to mention the fact that the, the duopoly, and by that I mean Democrats in alliance with Republicans, uh, make it really, really difficult for third parties, libertarians and all the rest of third parties to get on the ballot in the first place. The requirements for a third party are different to get on the ballot. Uh, more signatures to gather, uh, a smaller time window to gather signatures. And during uh, uh, COVID-19 with the uh, uh, pandemic and six foot distancing and all the rest uh, rules in place, it becomes nearly uh, impossible for a third party in many states to, uh, to get enough signatures to actually get on the ballot. So it's a, uh, it's a, a conscious uh, and a planned uh, effort on the part of uh, the, the duopoly to make sure they don't have any competition at all. Yeah, I know Arizona literally passed a law where in arguments they said it was to make it harder for libertarians to get on the ballot. And then the Supreme Court said it was perfectly fine. But of course, they write the rules that the Supreme Court interprets. So of course, they're going to get away with it. It's, <laughs> you know, when they write the rules and we have to take them to court saying they violated their rules. Well, no, because they wrote them. And if those people who write the rules know what the rules say, right? The, I was reading a story about how... Um, this vote blue thing that Black Lives Matter, they use this vote blue, uh, this Democrat vote blue uh, processing service to process their their um, money. And they've got this loophole. If you leave your money in there for 60 days, then it goes into the vote blue and they can donate it to whoever they want. So like if Black Lives Matter raises all this money and they don't pull that money out within 60 days, vote blue can then donate it to whatever Democrat cause they want. And they say, well, that's a loophole. No, it's not. They designed it that way. <laughs> when they wrote the laws, they designed those loopholes. That's not a loophole. It's a feature. <laughs> it's a feature. Well, no, it's a benefit. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sales talk. It's, Let's move it's on. a feature of the law, and we are about out of time. So if you guys want any information on these subjects, please go to libertariancounterpoint.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, please like the button, subscribe, do all that good stuff. And I believe next week we have uh, Spike Cohen on, right? Yep, Spike Cohen will be on. He'll be able to uh, uh, explain why he should be vice president of the United States. All right, and we're out of time. Thank you guys for joining us. Please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching The Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast on YouTube and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.